friends online. So I'm Monica Popo, I'm the wellness administrator for HR. So today we have Beth Manley and John Malarkey here from Franklin Met and Liberty Mutual respectively. So we do also have a, I'll deal with that in a minute. We also have a $25 gift card that we're raffling off through John. So please fill out the information on the table, the contact card. If you're online, just give me your email and phone number and I'll fill that out for you. Turn it over to Beth and turn off this one. Thank you. So this is a topic that is very close to my heart. Um, I am the adult financial education manager for the Franklin Met Federal Credit Union. Um, but right out of college, I got a job with Chrysler Financial, and I worked with them for 14 years. So my start in the world of finance was through a captive automotive finance company. And I held many positions, and the final few positions I had with them, I was out as a sales rep with the dealerships. So I was at dealerships on a daily basis, working with them and their finance managers and the owners, understanding how they did their business um, from, from front to back. So, having worked for them for so long, I was kind of immune to the whole process, and then when my company closed, I now was on the other side and I had to deal with it. So, my favorite, learn from my fail, is what happened to me as a new car buyer before I started working for a finance company. I was 23 years old and I had credit and a job, and I saw a car I really wanted, and I didn't need a cosigner. So the car that I wanted was a 95 Pontiac Sunfire and it was raspberry metallic. So I had a pink car. My first new car, I'd only ever paid cash for used cars before. Um, we had a mechanic, my parents always bought used cars. We would buy from the mechanic um, or we would buy off of a new car lot and get it reviewed by the mechanic before we would, we would make the deal. So this was a big deal for me, I was so excited. And I was a, a shrewd negotiator. I went into that dealership and I told them, I will not pay more than $250 a month for that car. And I thought I was smart. It wasn't until not even a year later that I got the job with Chrysler Financial and started getting educated into the business and really took a look at my deal that I realized they put me in a 60 month lease. I ended up in the long run paying about $25,000 for about a $17,000 car. And to make matter, to add insult to injury, I got relocated with my company and the lease was through a local bank and they wouldn't allow me to, to transfer it to the new state for registration. They made me buy it outright. So I had to keep it even longer. So needless to say, it kind of soured me to that whole experience. But what it comes down to is, is that the dealership did exactly what I wanted them to do. I went in and I said to them, I want to buy this car for that monthly payment and they found a way to make it happen I should have been ex I should have been very excited but it was a short-sighted deal I wasn't looking down the road at what was really going to be happening with that car knowing that it was not an expensive car it was not a well-made car might not even have lasted that long um, so I want you to all learn from my fail we're going to touch on a bunch of different topics today and if you have a question about something specific Please just stop me, it's not a problem. Um, we are partners with Drexel, and we are located on campus. Um, Dan Kedamuso, who is the manager, um, he was not able to make it today. Um, I'm speaking to you on his behalf also. So, I was able to get you guys the coupon that we usually reserve for when we teach this to um, high school seniors and their parents. We, we provide this to like PTOs, this class. I've revamped it so that it's more applicable to adult buyers. Um, I, the topics are a little bit more advanced now. We kind of, not that we dumb it down, but we kind of dumb it down a little bit for the high school kids so they, they understand it. Um, but we offer a 1% discount off of our rates for anybody who takes this class. So if you are legitimately shopping for a vehicle right now, um, especially if you're looking for a new vehicle because a lot of times you have rebates online that you can get. So this rate, if your credit is a 700 or better, and you're buying a new or used vehicle that's a 2015 or better, you're going to be able to get a rate that's well below 2% with this coupon. But you have to have taken part in this class. For those who are online, 
Um, your names, if you've registered, will be provided to Dan, and you can go to the branch to pick up your coupon if you're interested. And the coupon is good to the end of June, so not a terrible rush. Um, but we'll talk about some buying options because that's one of the topics that we talk about is financing. But we're going to talk about the whole buying process and the insurance process too. So as I said, and forgive me, I don't have my screen up here. Um, so we're going to talk about how to determine your budget. Wants versus needs because there can be some blurred lines there. How to negotiate a fair price. We're going to talk about the cost of ownership because this is often overlooked by even the most savvy buyers. Um, buying or leasing and getting a fair rate because that is important to know what you're eligible for and know what is fair. And then we're also going to talk about finding quality affordable car insurance. Um, and then we do have a subject matter expert, um, John over here from Liberty Mutual, who can go into a little bit more detail than I will. So how do you know how much you can afford to spend on a car? Well, Ideally, you want to pay cash because it's a depreciating asset. The value is going down. But if that's not realistic for a lot of us. The rule is the 24-10 rule. So what that means is you want to have 20% down. You want to finance it for more than four, no more than 48 months. And you don't want the payment to be more than 10% of your gross monthly income. And that has to include auto insurance. It's important to understand when we make guidelines, there's a reason. It's an ideal situation. It might not be realistic for many of us. But if you want to ensure that you're not going to get in over your head when you're making a purchase, this is a really good starting point. At the very least, I think the 10% guideline, depending on your personal debt to income and your personal financial situation, is a really good place to be. So. The average down payment for a new or used vehicle is actually 10%. The average term for a new vehicle financed is 68 months. And the average term for a used vehicle loan is 61 months. So you can see this is what's really going on versus what we would love to see going on. So what do I need versus what do I want? And this is a really important thing to think about. When I was living in Florida and I finally got out of my Sunfire, I got myself a Jeep Cherokee, which I absolutely loved. And the dealership was like, you don't need to spend the extra money and get yourself the 4x4 model. You can get yourself the two-wheel drive model. You'll be fine. Until a year later, I was transferred to Chicago. Again, hindsight is 2020, but if you know that your working conditions are such that you're going to be commuting um, a long distance, comfort is going to be something you want to consider. Miles per gallon is probably going to be something you want to consider. Frankly, I don't know that I would necessarily want to have a very expensive fancy car if I was going to be street parking in Center City, Philadelphia on a regular basis. Um, that would be a concern that I'd always be looking for dings and that would stress me out, especially if I'd spent a lot of money on it. If the car is not a good fit, no matter how much you think you love it, you're going to regret the purchase. So ask yourself, number one, what can I afford? That needs to be your starting point. No matter how fabulous a car is, if you can't realistically afford it, you're going to end up hating this purchase and regretting it. So you need to look at your down payment, what you can get together, your monthly payment. Miles per gallon is important. If you are on a budget, you need to seriously look at the cost of gas because buying a used high-end vehicle might look like a really great deal. But not when you take into consideration how long your commute is in the fact that you're going to be buying premium gasoline. It's a significant cost. And we're going to talk about cost of ownership and go into some really good details about this. And I have some resources where you can find that depending on where you're looking for. So we talk about comfort, reliability, safety. If you're driving your kids around, obviously you need something with a back seat. Um, the Roadster's not going to work for you, even though it gets great gas mileage because it's a light car. Um, and then what do you want? Style should be your final consideration. We like to think that. It doesn't always happen that way because we can be a little impulsive. You know, um, we see something that looks really nice and maybe we're willing to compromise on a few other things because it looks good. Hopefully you can find all these things. So let's find a vehicle. So how do you find a fair price? 
I even before we partnered with TrueCar.com, I actually went and used TrueCar.com to get my vehicle. Um, I was shopping around and I did my research. I went to Consumer Reports. Um, I went to Edmunds.com, and I was not comfortable negotiating with a dealer at this point because I had never really had to do it other than that first mishap. You know, I worked for a car company for 14 years, so as soon as I became eligible, I didn't have to negotiate. I could walk into the dealership and buy a vehicle at employee purchase price. It was in black and white. It was there. Same with my family. And then once I got to a certain level within the company, I had company cars. I didn't even have to think about it. They're like, here's your car. So I had gone about 12 years without walking into a dealership on that side. So I was nervous. And then the other part of it is, is that working for this car company, I had to buy when I was buying from that company. I mean, it was kind of a big no-no to buy from another manufacturer. So now the whole world was kind of open to me, in theory. Um, so where was I going to start? Well, I had a child, so safety was important to me. I needed something that got good gas mileage because I had a long commute. So these were the things that were going through my head. I looked at Consumer Reports, um, and certain brands were rated very well. Um, and then I was able to narrow it down to one or two brands. And then I started looking to see if it made sense for me to shop new or used, depending on how the car held its value, um, how, the re how it was as far as repairs and things like that. Um, and so much of this information is available on TrueCar. TrueCar is, I loved it. Um, the dealerships were showing me the prices for the exact vehicle that I wanted. Um, sometimes you have, depending on who you're with or what organizations you're with, like if you're a veteran, things like that, there may be additional discounts and they'll let you know before you even go in. Um, if there are rebates on, that, on the car, if it's a new <coughs> car, they'll tell you about that. Um, there are another website that um, just started advertising that I went and looked at is Carvana. Um, I liked Carvana also. I did not use them to buy my car, but the thing that I liked about them is, is that they listed all the deals and they kind of told you based on the average prices if it was a good deal or if it wasn't such a good deal as far as the used car market goes. Um, Edmunds.com is a fabulous resource for when you're doing your initial research on a vehicle. Edmunds.com has something that they've trademarked that I think is one of the best tools when you're trying to decide what you want. It's the cost of ownership. They go into great details over a five-year period. What's the average cost of ownership for both a new and a used car? Taking several things into consideration. Um, NADA, another really good resource. Um, recommend that too to get information on your trade if you have a trade. <laughs> So, what can your money buy using this rule? This is Sean, and this is a very specific case study, and we're going to go into the details as to why this is very specific. So, Sean is a 25-year-old single male college graduate who's a renter with good credit living in the suburbs. And the reason that all these little points are so important is because for this guy, insurance is going to be a little expensive and that's going to affect that whole 10%. So based on his income, he should be able to afford a $391 a month car payment, which isn't a terrible car payment. I mean, that's, you can have some decent choices, especially if you've got that 20% down payment. The problem is, is that that has to include his car insurance and living in the suburbs. If he was in the city, it'd probably be a lot more than that, and John will go into that. Um, his car insurance is about, two, about 225 a month. So that doesn't leave a whole lot for that car payment. $166 a month for a car payment. So what can he buy? I found a 2016 used Chevy Malibu. I searched online and I got this information about six weeks ago. I keep revamping this presentation because I want to make sure that everything is, is true and legitimate. Didn't have bad miles. I believe it had under 40,000 miles. Advertised price was $9,000. Now, don't forget about your sales tax, and I believe if you live in the city, your sales tax is a little higher, too. Um, with 20% down, which is just under $2,000, 48 months financed at 2.69, which is the rate that he would currently qualify for if he didn't take this class. Um, he'd be looking at a payment that's right within his budget. So this is a realistic starter vehicle for this gentleman. This is the kind of thing that you want to think about, because if 
he gets into a car payment that's significantly higher, he has an opportunity cost. That opportunity cost might be that he can't afford a nicer apartment or if he can then afford a house, he might not be able to afford his mortgage payment because he's locked in for the next five, six, seven years to a higher car payment. And these are the types of things that we need to be thinking about when we're shopping. Cost to own is so important. It's often overlooked. So I took this particular vehicle the cost of ownership. Now, I didn't do the total cost of ownership because I think it's kind of double dipping with depreciation and tax and all that and the financing. So I just took the fuel, the insurance, the maintenance, and the repairs. Over a five-year period, that's the average for this particular vehicle. And you can get all this information on Edmunds.com. So when you're shopping for your, your vehicle, you can see, okay, um, so my husband really loves to follow a lot of the, um, the Reddits regarding cars and an individual bought a used Land Rover from CarSense about four or five years ago. And at the time, he paid about $2,000 for an extended warranty on that Land Rover. And I don't know about you, but I think Land Rovers are beautiful cars. But they are a nightmare when it comes to mechanical failures. They're just kind of known for that. So he got a good deal, paid about two grand for this extended warranty. And he kind of blogged all the repairs that were covered under it. And within a two year period, it was more than $7,000 worth of repairs that were covered by that. To the point where when he went back to the dealership because he was gonna get rid of the car, the cost of that same warranty had doubled. And he was kind of the case study for that because the dealership realized that selling it for that amount of money, they were losing. So. Be aware when you're shopping, if your vehicle, especially if you're buying a used vehicle, if warranty issues, no matter how much you love it, if repairs and things like that are going to be an issue in the long run because of how that vehicle performs, then maybe an extended warranty is something for you to consider if you are going to be keeping that vehicle past its manufacturer's warranty. So, what if Sean wanted something a little bit flashier? I found a 2011 BMW for $9,000. Miles were a little high, it had about hmm, 70, 80,000 miles. But still, it's $9,000, it's right within his budget. Well, let's see what the cost of ownership is for that puppy. Over the same period, $35,000. Because everything is more expensive. Your tires, your oil changes, your fuel, your miles per gallon are gonna be significantly lower. Um, just all that your insurance is going to be higher, especially for him. If this is a sporty car, insurance is gonna be much higher. So he's thinking he's looking at two deals that are almost identical because he's not looking at the big picture. And that's one of the reasons why I called this, you know, car buying 360. Because we tend to have tunnel vision and we're only looking at that, walking on the dealership, negotiating a price point. There's so much more to it that you need to be looking at. <coughs> so what if you have a car to trade in? Well, that's great. Know the value of your trade before you even start talking to the dealership. You want to have it be a separate negotiation. I wouldn't even discuss having a trade with the dealership. Go in, know your price, what you're willing to pay, and then bring your trade into it after the fact. It may be more trouble for you to sell it yourself. Um, but in the long run, you're probably going to get more money from it for it. Um, if you choose to trade it in, the one big benefit of that is that you don't pay sales tax on the portion of the trade. So the way this works is, is that if you buy a car for $20,000 and you put $5,000 down, you're financing fifteen. dollars but you're paying sales tax on the whole $20,000. If you have a trade-in that's worth $5,000 versus the money down, you're still financing 15, but you're also only paying sales tax on that 15 because the government recognizes that when you purchase that vehicle, you paid sales tax on it. So you do get a discount that way. So you just have to say, if the dealership's giving you a fair price close to what the trade-in value is, if you don't have somebody offhand who you know is willing to buy the car, a family member, is willing to give you a, a, a decent value for the car, it might pay for you to trade it in. 
But again, treat that as a separate negotiation. So retail <coughs> versus trade-in. When you're trading in your car, and I don't want to paint dealerships as bad guys, because having been out there and worked with many, many, many dealerships, there are some really great business people, um, family people, um, people who are out there, and they want to make money. I mean, they are for-profit institutions, um, but they're not, they're looking to build a relationship with you, and they want you to keep coming back and referring them business. And there are, I know this is shocking, but there are actually dealerships out there that are like that. But keep in mind that they do have to keep the lights on and pay their employees and pay their mechanics and, and such. So, I took my car and I went, oh, my goodness. I just talked. Oh no. Sorry. I'll try to fix it. I'll okay. let you talk. No problem. <laughs> so, I took my car. I have my slides here. And the trade in value on my car was roughly at average about 18500 The purchase value, if I were going to go and buy it and pay retail for it at the dealership, on average dealerships were charging about twenty one four for it. So about a $2,800 difference <coughs> between what I could reasonably expect to get as a trade-in versus what I was going to probably pay for it if I were buying it outright myself from a dealership as a used car. So you're not gonna see that if you're trading the car in. That's not gonna be the difference that you're going to get in your sales tax. So if you have a, a trade that's worth quite a bit of money, you might be better off trying to sell it yourself, going through that trouble. Because I mean, you know, a couple thousand dollars might be worth it for you. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we are up to slide 15. It's the one that says new auto, used auto, new auto lease. So if you're not paying cash for your car, you have three choices. Um, and has anybody in here leased a car before? Okay. So this can actually be a really great thing or it can be a really bad decision. It just depends on your personal, your, how you drive, where you drive, um, what you want, what you're looking for. Um, I leased for years. Um, I won't do that now because it doesn't make sense for my lifestyle. And we're going to go into some details about leasing. The credit union does not do leasing, but I think it's, it, as I said before, it's important for you to know because it might be something that's worth it for you to do. So, new auto loans. The pros. Um, when you're finished, you own the car. You, if properly maintained, it could last you for quite a long time. You've got the manufacturer's warranty that's going to last you typically three years, 36,000 miles. Some of them have drivetrain warranty, so the transmission, that kind of thing, that's going to last even longer. Um, manufacturers sometimes have special offers when you're buying a car. The cons are it's typically the most expensive option. Um, it's a depreciating asset. The minute you drive it off the lot, it's worth, worth less money than you paid for it. Um, and you're responsible for wear and tear. So while things like um, the transmission is covered or the radiator, you know, if you blow something, it goes, that's covered under your warranty. Tires, which can be very expensive, that is not covered. And typically, as your manufacturing warranty runs out, your tires are probably going to be due also. So you might be hit with some expensive repairs at that point. Sort of back, we're just on a different Oh, side. fabulous. Okay, yeah, we're good. Back. Side yeah. Around. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, just like click it on there, but on here, like here. No. no. Yeah, click. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Just click that. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Krista. Let's get back to where we are. Okay, so let's talk about the next option. It doesn't want to go. Now. You have to really. No problem. Oh, if he wants to go. All right. Well, mm -hmm. use autos. Go to the next slide. Try and. Nope. Sorry about the technical difficulties there. Want to instead of next, go to the next slide. Next slide. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. All right. Don't worry about it. Okay. Use autos. Typically, if you're going to get the most bang for your buck, um, it is the most affordable in most cases. 
and you're going to own the vehicle when you're done paying for it. Um, lower depreciation because it's already taken its initial hit, and lower initial cost versus a new auto. The cons are you are responsible for wear and tear, and it might be out of warranty at the point that you buy it. Um, finance rates tend to be a little bit higher um, depending on where you look. Then you're not going to usually you're not going to get special financing from the manufacturer. Um, we do have really good rates on newer used vehicles, so it's not quite that bad. Um, and you can't be sure that the vehicle hasn't been maintained. You do have resources like Carfax that you can go and you can see if there was an accident, um, see if there was any body damage, um, if it's not obvious. My big recommendation is if you are considering a used vehicle, make sure you have a reliable mechanic that you can take the car to before you pull the trigger and buy the car so that you can make sure that from top to bottom the car has been checked out so that there's not anything that you find out, you know, two, three months down the road that's um, a costly mistake. So how is leasing different? So with leasing, you are only paying for the portion of the vehicle that you're using. And the example that I'll use is the price of the car is $30,000. At the end of 36 months or three years, they estimate the value is worth $20,000. They call this the residual value, what's left over. So if you lease the car for 36 months, you're going to pay $10,000 on the value of that car because that's what they estimate it's going to depreciate. So there's going to be an interest rate factor calculated into that. And the disclosures on leases are a little bit grayer. Um, so when you look at your contract, your leasing contract, there is a highlighted box, and this is mandated by the federal government. Um, they call it the Fed box. Um, and a lot of this came about because people were getting into leases and they had no clue about what was going on. So the interest factor or the rate factor is going to be um, like point two, three, whatever, depending on what you qualify for. If you times that by 2,400, you can convert that to an interest rate. And this is one of those things that most people aren't aware of. So if you want to get an understanding of what you're qualifying for. Now, a lot of times lease rates um, are going through the manufacturer, so it's probably going to be a halfway decent rate. If you have a lump sum of cash and you don't want to, you don't want to have monthly payment, you want the car for say 24 months, you want to pay a lump sum, turn the car back in and be done with it for whatever reason, there's usually a discount for that because the bank is not taking any risk at that point. Um, I leased for years. Um, the cons with leases are big though. If you don't know what you're getting yourself into, you can have a lot of extra expenses. So the big one is, is that you see these great prices advertised for leases, $1.99 a month, that is typically a 10,000 mile a year lease. Most people do not drive 10,000 miles a year. And a typical penalty for going over your miles is 25 cents a mile. So I had a conversation with somebody <coughs> last time I taught this and they said their friend was already at their miles and they had a year left to go. And we estimated that based on the way they drive, they're going to be looking at about a $3,000 penalty in miles. It can be huge. There's also wear and tear because you don't own that car. You're just basically using it for this time period. It has to be maintained and it has to be maintained well. You have to make sure that your insurance deductible isn't too low, excuse me, isn't too high. If you can't afford to have a repair done because you have a thousand or a two a twenty five I get a thousand I think is the cap for most. So if you have a thousand dollar deductible and you can't come up with that thousand dollars to get the car repaired, you're gonna be in trouble because the car company, when they take that car back, is going to fine you for that because they're going to do the repair and then they're going to charge you for it because the car has to be resold and they want to make sure they get the most value out of it that they can. Sometimes there are acquisition fees, security deposits. A lot of this is depending on um, who the leasing agent is and um, how good your credit is, just like with an apartment. And then a lot of times they try and mail you with a, um, what's the fee at the end? Um, acquisition and dip dip disposition fee, thank you. Disposition fee, so basically it's for the bank to pay the dealer to detail the car to take it to auction to sell it if the dealership doesn't want to pay for it. And that could be um, that could be the equivalent of one of your car payments. I mean, I, I remember I think my disposition fee was like $350 when I had my lease. Um, 
So why not just select a longer term to get the car you want and make it more affordable? Well, in some cases, as we looked with the average, it does make sense. You know, if, if you've made, if you've done your research, you've done your homework, it might make sense for you to take it out to 60 months or even 72 months. If you know you're gonna be using this car for a long time, you're gonna maintain it, um, it's something that you really love. My husband has always kept his cars for an extended period of time. His philosophy, and he is like the poster child for responsible buying. Um, I always leased, he always bought. He would buy his car, he would pay off as quickly as possible, and whenever the car payment was, he would then turn around and put that into an investment. So that 10 years, 10 years, like he has kept his cars for 10 years on a regular basis. He can then turn around and he has almost the entire down payment um, for the car. You know, he, he has at least half, if not three quarters of the car already paid for, and he just keeps going through that. And it's a really good way to be if you can do it. Um, he has gotten me into that habit, so I held my car for 10 years, the last one that I bought. I bought it used, I got a really good deal. And I started paying myself a car payment. And then when it came time to buy my, my shiny new Subaru that I love very much. Not, I'm not advocating Subarus, I'm not here on behalf of the credit union to talk about any specific brand of car. Um, but I had a really huge down payment because for several years I was used to that car payment, I knew what I was comfortable with, and I had it in my savings account. And it made the whole process a lot less stressful for me because the payment at a shorter term was going to be more affordable. So going, sorry, going back to not taking out for a longer period of time, it goes back to, yes. I have one question. Sure. The way you were calculating cost of ownership, mm -hmm. was that an app? Or was that something that that's on yourself? Edmunds.com. Okay. Yeah. Edmunds.com. If you go to their search function and type in true cost of ownership or just cost of ownership, they'll bring it up. And okay. they got it for most vehicles. I believe it goes back um, at least seven or eight years. Okay. So it, they do have it for some older vehicles too. Thank you. Absolutely. Good question. So we looked at the cost of ownership. So if you were buying a vehicle that costs more money, and you're stretching out the financing to make the monthly payment fit into your 10% of your gross income. That's great, but are you looking at all those other costs? Are you looking at what that insurance payment is going to cost you? What the, what the, the, um, the tires, the fuel, all these other things, because it tends to snowball, especially as the car gets older. Cars get less fuel efficient as they get older, so if you're paying a lot of money now, the price of fuel is going up, and your car is not going to have as good a gas mileage as it gets older once it hits those five, six, seven year marks. So these are things that you need to take into consideration. If you looked at that chart for the BMW, you can see that as you get farther out, the cost of fuel really shoots up on that vehicle. So traditional financing. If you choose to use traditional financing, so this would be a new car or used car, um, how do you find a good rate? How do you know if you're getting a good rate? You need to shop before you buy. And this is the this is the biggest thing I, I need to stress. Know what your credit looks like. You can go to annualcreditreport.com and make sure that everything that's being reported against you is legitimate and good, that there are no blips that you need to take care of before you have your credit pulled. If you come into the credit union, we will pull your credit, we will tell you what your FICO score is, and that's important. You can go to Credit Karma and you can get your score. That is not a FICO score. That is a Vantage in score. That is not the same score that the dealer is going to be pulling when they shop you around to different banks. So, um, as a non-for-profit, we are a, we're a cooperative organization and we are here to support our members and we have very low rates. Credit unions in general have very low rates. You will be hard pressed to find something um, better than what we are actually advertising right now. Um, and that's for a 700 FICO and above on a 2015 or newer, does not have to be a new car. So you can walk in and you can have your financing in place and you can let the dealership talk to you about it because you'll kind of know where your, where your credit falls, you'll know what you're eligible for. And if you know what your FICO score is, you can get a ballpark figure from a dealership. They have charts in the finance office that break down everything. If you're financing this year and your score is this, this is the rate that you're going to get from bank XYZ. So it's it's that cut and dry. And I'm speaking from personal experience. I was I was a credit buyer for many years. 
So I was on the other end of the phone with the dealership negotiating that price. Now, manufacturers' <coughs> websites are another good, good place to go. Sometimes there are certified pre-owned vehicles that have special rates. You see this a lot with high-end vehicles like Mercedes-Benzes and BMWs, that they'll have like a special financing rate for that. Um, they are trying to boost up dealership sales, um, get good trade-ins, things like that for the dealerships. We have a special product, and I've used this myself, my husband's used this, it's really great, it's called an Auto Express. So if you're starting to shop, if your credit is halfway decent, I believe if you're a 680 or above, you would, you would typically qualify for this. If you know generally what year you're gonna buy, so it would, if you fell into that 2015, a newer vehicle didn't have to be a new vehicle, you go in and you get pre-approved for an amount, not on a specific vehicle. And this takes a lot of pressure off you because you're not locked into a particular dealership. You can go and you can look online at your true car, you can get a good rate, then you can negotiate your trade. You've got two dealers that are gonna give you the same price on, the, on a new car, but one can give you a better deal on your trade-in then you can take your, your draft, it's an odd draft, and you can go there. And you're approved up to a certain point, you don't even have to use all that money. If you negotiate a better price, you write out the check for a lower dollar amount, and then your loan is created based on that deal that you've, you've uh, agreed to with the dealership. Um, very nice tool. And the, um, the coupon is good for that, yes? What was the name of the extension? It's called Auto Express, and it's offered at the, at the, um, the credit union. And if you're in a situation where you can't necessarily stop down at the branch, call Dan up um, and he can talk to you about the different options that we have depending on where your credit falls, things like that. Um, so, why does the dealership want to get your financing for you? It's because this is a big profit center for the dealership. So, finance companies give commissions to finance managers and dealerships in a variety of different ways. Um, we do not, we are a direct lender. We are not indirect. Um, that's the difference between you coming into my branch and getting a, a, a loan versus you going through the dealership. Most of your captive finance sources like Mitsubishi Credit, BMW Credit, things like that, they're captive finance sources. You as an individual cannot go to them directly to get your loan. You have to go through the dealership as a filter. So there's no transparency at all. Um, typically, if you're getting like a 0% or 1.9% from the dealership, the dealership, it's not impacting you that you're going through the dealership. Uh, they're paying the dealership what's called a flat. It's maybe $150, $250. It could depend on how much, of the, how much the cost of the car was that they're financing, and then everybody's happy. But with some banks, um, they allow the dealers to mark up the rate. And some banks will allow the dealership to mark up the rate up to two and a half percent. So if you don't know what you are initially eligible for, you the dealership could be making a lot of money off of you. So we call that the back end. That's the dealership. When the dealership sells you a car, makes a profit off of the selling of the car that's the front end. But there are a lot of ways that the dealership is going to be making money off the back end. Um, products like rust and dust, which would be like that nice coating that they put on the car. Um, if you're going to keep your car for 10 plus 12 years, if you really want to put some, uh, you know, one of those nice coatings on your car, that's fine. But to be honest with you, if realistically you're going to keep your car for three, four years like the rest of us, what kind of garbage piece of car are you driving that after four years your paint is completely worn off? I mean, that's my thinking personally. Um, and I had this conversation with my mother. She was buying a used Mercedes. She had always wanted to have a Mercedes, so they were. In, I was in the finance office with her, and I was really getting irritated because it was one of those situations where she was just sitting there and taking it all in, and oh, they gave me a great rate, and they get this, and they did that for me. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to get. I want to get the coating. And I looked at her and said, "You've never even kept the lease to the end of the term. You turn your leases in after three years. This car is in perfect condition. You're probably going to keep it for two years." Um, you're going to pay another $1,000 because you want to protect the paint. Get it waxed. It'll be fine. And she didn't listen to me. She paid too much. But that's either here or there. Sometimes your family doesn't want to listen when you have a wealth of knowledge on a specific topic. They would rather go elsewhere. But um, 
Anyway, I digress. I really do not recommend walking into the dealership and letting the finance manager do all your work for you because they are there to earn money. <coughs> that is a realistic expectation. If they are working for you, they should get money. But you have to see you're probably going to be paying out of your deal for that, not the bank. So know what you qualify for, know what your best rate is before you start talking to the finance manager about how much you're going to finance and what the rate cost is going to be. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Some of them, when they're advertising 0% interest, somebody's yes. telling me it's not really 0% interest. It is. And here's the deal. So um, it's called a subvented rate. So the manufacturer is trying to promote sales. So the manufacturer is actually paying for your financing. And that's why typically you have to choose between a rebate or the 0%. But yeah, no, that's a really good question. You know, it is, it is truly a 0% rate. Um, it's just that somebody else is paying for it to... Get the car off of, off the lot. You you see that when they're they've got a glut of vehicles um, and they're trying to move inventory, especially at the end. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, we're we're almost done. Insurance. Um, I'm gonna have John come come up in a minute. We have um, we have a relationship with Liberty Mutual. I Liberty Mutual is a great company. There are a lot of really great companies out there. You need to shop around. If you've had the same insurance company for many, many years, my mother has been with the same company for over 40 years. She would not even think about looking elsewhere. And I guarantee she's paying too much. But she has her agent, she loves her agent, and she has a good relationship. And she feels she's getting good value, and that's okay. Um, but we find that a lot of the companies that have these big budgets for advertising might not necessarily be providing the best service. Um, so. I highly recommend going to Consumer Reports. Consumer Reports is a really good resource. It's a great resource for looking for your vehicles also because it does a lot of rating for vehicles. I, I looked at Consumer Reports, I looked at Edmunds, Car and Driver is a good resource. If you don't have a subscription to them, you can usually go to the library and get a free copy. Um, at least you can you know go through it, get some ideas. Um, they do their annual car buying um, issues for both, um, for, for, excuse me, for Consumer Reports. But I was really surprised that two of the top rated, and this is for customer service and such, two of the top rated insurance companies were insurance companies that most people have never heard of. And one of the reasons is because they're not there for everyone. So one of the top rated was USAA. And unless you have a connection to the military, you cannot be part of USAA. And the other one was New Jersey manufacturers. New Jersey manufacturers, they function very similar to a, um, like a credit union and that you have to have a company connection to them. Um, the only reason I had ever even heard of New Jersey manufacturers is because my brother and sister and all work for them. So, but this is not information that I would even have been aware of if I hadn't researched. So you might have a family member, you know, maybe when your parents was in the military and they had that connection. Um, otherwise, we have this fabulous company, Liberty Mutual, with an Im impeccable reputation and they have partnered with us to give our members a discount off of their rates. Um, I'm gonna just talk very briefly about, actually, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm still gonna let you come up and talk. Because the big thing that my, my part, portion, hold on one second, my portion that I like to talk about is don't, don't discount one area and regret it later. Don't have a very high deductible if you can't afford to have put that money aside because you're going to regret it later. Um, watch the coverage that you choose very carefully and make sure when you're comparing rates that you're comparing coverage also. You want to okay. just talk about Liberty Mutual for a little bit. Okay, thank you. Can I ask you? Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. So, can you comment on those companies where you can buy a car for a set price? Oh, like, um, I'll be honest with you, like car sense and things like that? Yeah. yeah. That? Or going online and getting. There's companies that will get bids oh. from different. That's right. right, and that's what Carvana is like so that. Carvana, it's not, they're not necessarily so bids, but the dealerships are going to advertise, you, and you're getting to see all the different dealers advertising oh, the prices on similar that. vehicles. Like you'll do a search. I will see Carvana. The car is very similar to what they do. Carsense and what's the other one? Thank you. Carsense and CarMax are used car dealerships that are not affiliated with the manufacturer. And they have a no-haggle uh, policy. 
And I think for some people, that's okay. Um, you just have to still make sure you've done your research that the price they're not willing to negotiate is still a good price because there's no guarantee. You know, if they're telling you, we're not going to give you any, you know, this is what you're going to pay for it, well, that's good. But if there's a, a reputable, reputable dealership down the street who's willing to sell an almost identical car for less money, it might be worth my going there. Um, you won't know that until you start negotiating. <laughs> well, and that's the, that's the thing is that that's why I think like car, a true car is a good resource. Edmonds is a good resource, um, and Carvana will tell you what used cars are going for in your area. So you you'll have all that information. They'll give you real bins, and you can even check it against NADA, NADA.com. Uh, or Kelly Blue Book, uh, KBB.com. Those are good resources for getting values of vehicles too. Um, if you don't want to pay the money to go and get a, a car fax on a vehicle at that point. But I do recommend um, if you're buying from any of these organizations that before you pull the trigger, it might pay for you to get a car sense, a car fax report if they're not doing it for you. A lot of times they will give you the car fax and they'll say, you know, no accident history, that kind of thing. So that's a good question, yeah. I have friends who bought from them. Um, I was looking when I was considering buying a used vehicle, and I personally found that I could do a little bit better, um, but it is kind of a no-stress situation. I mean, the only thing you will negotiate for is your trade, because that's where you're going to have that uh, that back and forth, because they do have some more room on that. I have one question. I just yeah. want to be aware of John's time. Sorry. Someone's asking between 0% interest and rebates, which is usually a better option? That is a fabulous question. You need to go online and use a calculator to figure it out because it all has to do with how much the car costs. Because if it's a very expensive car and it's not a huge rebate, the 0% in the long run is definitely going to be a better deal for you. But if it's a decent rebate and you're able to go to say the credit union and get you know, 2.69 or 1.69 financing for 72 months, then you got to look at that monthly payment and say, okay, taking the rebate and getting this financing in the long run is going to be a better deal for me. So it's, it's one of those things where it can be either one. You have to do the math and figure it out. And we have calculators. If you're, if you're on the fence, um, you can go to our website, um, and we have calculators that will tell you exactly based on how much you finance and for how long. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I know you guys are pressed for time, so I'm going to try to make this fast. So, uh, my name is John Malarkey. I work for Liberty Mutual. I'm sure some of you have seen me around at the benefits fairs. I'm at all the uh, events, uh, the benefit the type of benefits. Uh, I'm a local agent. I work in the Bluebell office and sometimes in the Philadelphia office at Fifth and Market. Um, and in addition, you know, we, we do have the partnership with Drexel, so, uh, as well as the Franklin Mint. Um, so you get a discounted rate through them. Um, but we'll talk today about uh, auto insurance, although you know, we, we provide coverage for all your stuff, homeowners and auto and whatever your insurance needs may be. But we'll, we'll talk about auto today. And we're just going to, um, you know, everybody has auto insurance, but a lot of people don't understand how it works. So we're going to try to give you a, uh, a quick uh, overview of how your insurance works and making sure you have the right type. So we'll do an introduction to auto, understanding your debt page, uh, see what coverages are available. Uh, discounts available to you and uh, making sure you have the right kind uh, of insurance. Um, so everyone knows they need insurance, but choosing the right coverage can be confusing. Um, how does your coverage work? What's the difference between uh, collision? H how does your coverage differ between a collision and having a tree fall on your car? Uh, is that covered? Um, are damages from like a flood or a fire or a hailstorm, is that covered? Uh, are, you, uh, are you covered in a car accident if you're at fault or if someone gets seriously injured? Is that going to be covered? So this is a typical deck page. Um, your deck page is going to show you what, what uh, vehicles are covered, how much you're paying for it, the type of coverage you have. It's going to list the named insurance. Um, liability. Everybody has to have liability coverage. Uh, what does liability coverage pay for? Does anyone know? Anyone want to take a guess? Does it pay for damage your car or if something hits your car or if you injure someone? It's C. It, it covers the damage uh, to the property of others or injuries to passengers in another car if you are in a crash. So 
So your bodily injury limits, typically uh, they call them split limits. You'll see that there are two numbers. Uh, it'll say 100,000 or 300,000, or it might say 50,000 or 100,000. Uh, split limits, the first number is the amount that they'll pay out for injuries, bodily injury uh, injuries per person, and the second number is per accident. So if you have 100,000, 300,000, your policy will cover each person's hospital bills up to 100,000, and each accident they cap at 300,000. Uh, it's very important to know, I just want to mention, keep in mind that auto insurance absolutely protects your car, but it also protects your assets. So if you're in an accident and you hurt someone, whatever limits of liability you have, once they're exhausted or used up, that's when someone can sue you. Uh, the state of Pennsylvania only requires you to have 15,000 15, per person, 30,000 per accident. And on reality, if you hurt someone, how far would $15,000 go in a hospital? Not too far. And once that's used up, they can sue you. Now, if you don't have anything, you live at home with mom, or maybe you're in an apartment, you don't have a whole lot of assets, you're probably not too concerned about that. But if you own a house, you have a job, you have a 401k, you have savings in the bank, future earnings, this could all be exposed to a lawsuit. So it's very important to have the right limits of liability. If you are a homeowner, I always suggest a minimum of $100,000, $300,000. And just because if you have higher limits doesn't mean you're going to pay a lot more. Because a lot of times it puts you into a better tiering, uh, gives you a better rate, because it looks at being responsible and having the right kind of coverage. Um, collision coverage. Uh, so collision, when, when people talk about putting full coverage on their car, they're talking about adding collision and comprehensive coverage. So collision is exactly what it sounds like. It's when you hit something or something hits you. You collide with something or someone collides with you. It's going to be a collision claim. It's covered regardless if you cause the accident or not. That doesn't matter. We all get in accidents. No one's trying to wreck their car, but these things happen. Um, if you get into a collision and you have collision coverage, the damage to your car is going to be covered. The liability always covers the other car that you hit, no matter what. Whether you have collision coverage or not, you're always... You're always going to, uh, your liability is always going to cover the damage you do to others, but then you need collision to cover your car. If you did not cause the accident, your insurance company will recoup your deductible. They'll go after that other person's insurance company get it back for you. If you cause the accident, you're always going to be on the hook for your deductible, but then your insurance will cover anything about that. Um, your deductible, just like you mentioned, could be as high as a thousand, could be as low as zero. Typically, most people carry a $500 collision deductible. That's what I recommend. Okay, uh, what does other than collision coverage pay for? This is also known as comprehensive. They call it other than collision. Um, does it cover my car stolen? If a rock hits my windshield? If my car is vandalized? Or if my car is damaged when I accidentally hit a deer? Or all above? Does anyone have a guess? All of the above. It's all of the above. It, it's, it's simply other than collision is exactly what it sounds like. It's any damage to your car that was not caused by a collision. So it's pretty broad. That's why they call it full coverage, because if you have collision and comprehensive, regardless of what happened to your car, it's going to be covered by one or the other. All right? So that's exactly what comprehensive or other than collision pays for. Um, a lot of times what I recommend is to go with a lower deductible on, on comprehensive coverage. It's much less expensive than collision. Uh, plus, you're almost always going to have to pay your deductible because if a rock hits your windshield, or if you hit a deer, or a branch falls on it, there's nobody to go after to recoup your deductible. So you're always gonna have to pay your deductible. That's why a lot of times I'll suggest going with a $100 deductible, or maybe 250. And like I said, this is the uh, less expensive of the two. A lot of times comp coverage is not that much, and dropping your deductible to 100 bucks is really not that much a year, so it's well worth it. Um, so that, that's what I suggest. Um, other than collision, um, other than collision covers losses resulting from incidents other than a collision. So I kind of explained that to you already. Um, additional coverage or medical payments. Uh, this covers you. So everyone in Pennsylvania has to carry at least five thousand dollars of medical co uh, uh, coverage. That just means if you get in an accident, you get hurt, your first five thousand dollars of medical expenses would be paid by your auto policy. Anything above that will typically be picked up by your uh, your um, medical insurance. Um, you can get more if you want. I would say sometimes when people have their own business or a business for themselves, I'll suggest more medical coverage. But if you have good medical <coughs> coverage benefits with the job, 
if you're more than 5,000. But everyone has to have 5,000. Um, you also have uninsured and underinsured motorist coverage. So this is optional. You don't have to have it, but it protects you and your family in case you get into an accident with someone that is uninsured, which is totally illegal, but unfortunately it does happen, or underinsured. This is more common. Uh, underinsured, they have insurance, but they might have bare bones coverage that really doesn't cover the damage they do to you. At least you'd have this coverage to fall back on. Uh, of course, you can always sue uh, that person, but I can tell you this: someone that's driving around with no insurance at all or bare minimum, they probably have, they probably don't have anything to go after them for. So at least this is something you'd have to fall back on uh, to protect yourself. Typically, we, we with the uninsured and underinsured motors, I always suggest having the same coverage as your liability. So if you have 100, 300 to protect others. I always suggest 100, 300 on the uninsured and uninsured to protect you. You should protect yourself, you know, same amount that you would protect others. Um, optional coverage you can add on 24 hour roadside assistance. Uh, Liberty Mutual's in all 50 states. Uh, if you have it with us, no matter where you're at, it goes with the car. If you ever get a flat tire, breakdown, lock your key <coughs> in your car, you just call the 1 800 number, they'll come get you. Uh, you can also add on rental reimbursement or rental coverage. This means if your car is in an accident uh, and you can't drive it, we'll pay for a rental car while your car is being fixed. Um, typically, you have options of uh, $30 allowance a day, $45 allowance, $50 allowance. I would say if, you know, if you're not too concerned about what type of car uh, the rental would be, you would go with the $30,000. It would probably get you like a Nissan Sentra or something like that. But if you wanted you know, a pickup truck or a minivan, you'd have to increase that. I highly recommend that coverage. Yes. From my personal experience, oh, yeah. we have used it many times. Yes. And I, I can tell you real quick, rental coverage costs a year, looking at a year, it typically costs 25 to $30 a year. But I can tell you this, and we have a partnership with Enterprise too, the minimum you're going to get out of there. Their, their minimum economy car is going to be at least $30 a day. So if you had to rent a car uh, for, a month. for a month, at $30 a day, you'd be up to close to $1,000. So it's like, you want to pay $1,000 or 30, you know, 25 to 30 a year. So if you rely on your car to get back and forth to work every day and can't afford to have it down for a week or two, you definitely should have the rental reimbursement. Um, other discounts available, the, the group savings is the Drexel discount um, through Liberty, uh, as well as the Franklin Men. You also get multiple policy discounts, obviously, if you bundle your insurance, we give you additional discounts. When you have more than one car to insure, you get a discount for that. Uh, billing, Drexel has an option of payroll. You can have your insurance payment come right out of your paycheck when you get paid once a month, or I know some people get paid uh, twice a month, uh, whatever it may be, you can have it come right out of there. There's no additional fees. You actually get a discount for it. And if you, you choose payroll, there's no down payment required for your insurance. You can get started without a down payment. Um, you also have vehicle safety features. When we put the VIN number in, it knows if it has airbags, anti-lock brakes, uh, rear view camera now. They have so many features in these cars, it's unbelievable. You mentioned the Subaru. Uh, Subarus have sensors all on them. They're very safe cars. There's a lot of safety features on them. So it picks it right up through the VIN number and you get all that. We also discount uh, hybrid vehicles. Um, we offer you know, good student discounts when you have to add your children on. Um, and other discounts that you know I would talk to you about when we uh, reviewed your insurance. Um, with Liberty Mutual, I'm, I'm the local sales rep. Uh, we also offer accident forgiveness, new car replacement. If you buy a brand new car, if it ever gets totaled, we replace it brand new, no cost to you. You know, the minute you drive them off the lot, they depreciate. So, um, you know, if you total the car, you know, you could possibly owe more than what it's worth. But with with us, we'll just replace it brand new, no cost to you. If you ever uh, get your car repaired at one of our recommended facilities, we have uh, facilities that we've done background checks on and, and we know they do good work, they're fully licensed, so you can get your car repaired wherever you want, it's up to you. If you use one of our recommended shops, we guarantee the uh, work for life. Uh, our policies are 12 months, some policies out there are six months, all state, state farm, Geico, some are 12, Liberty Mutual, Erie, Travelers. Um, but the advantage of a 12-month policy is your rate's locked in for 12 months. It's not going to change. Regardless of what happens, if you get in an accident or a speeding ticket, your rate's not going to change. It's locked in. And then, of course, we have 24-hour uh, 
uh, claims assistance. Uh, we're available if anything ever happens in the middle of the night or whatever, we're, we're available. We also uh, offer a, I know everything's going towards these apps and, and technology. Uh, we do have a uh, Liberty Mutual app you can download on your phone. You can, you can submit a claim through there. You can get your ID cards. You can print out your policy. Uh, this is available to people that like to do their business right through their phone. Um, and if anyone's interested, I left my cards on the table, um, my contact information. Um, anyone that thinks they're paying too much or might not have the right kind of insurance, it never hurts to give me a call. We can do it right over the phone. Typically takes 10 or 15 minutes, but might be able to save you a lot of money. Also, I'll make sure you have the right coverage so uh, you know, you don't expose yourself to uh, a lot of financial disasters. So. But that's it. I know we're up against the time. Let's pick if whoever fell out the card. We're going to pick a winner right now. You got everything? Got it. Does everybody who, who's here, one? does everybody have one of these coupons? If you are interested, you just need to, if you're doing it over the phone, you just need to let them know you have this and you can fax it over to the branch. Or you can bring it with you if you go to sign paperwork at the branch. Um, the winner is Anne Martella. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh there, you go. Thank you. there you go. Amazon. Nice Thank you everybody for coming. Yeah, sure. New Jersey. Yeah. And I'm always confused by that there's an extra medical adventure thing.